Hey, what's up everybody? This is Aaron from Aaron's Audio Corner and today we're going to be reviewing the Pioneer DJ VM50. This is a new bookshelf monitor speaker from Pioneer. Just came out about a month or so ago and overall I think it's a pretty good speaker. We're going to talk about the specs, some things I like, some things I didn't, so let's get it started. This is a powered two-way monitor. It features a five and a quarter inch mid-woofer and a one inch dome tweeter in a waveguide. And if we spin it around to the back, we can see some of the features on the back. So this contains a uh, port and it looks like, you know, kind of fancy on the back here. Now one would think that that's to help break up, you know, turbulence, things like that, you know, to help the overall port not contribute negatively to the sound and based on what I'm seeing I would say that's the case there's been a lot of speakers where I've tested them and the port actually has resonance and it really muddies up the sound and there was a point which we'll talk about in the data later where I thought that the, that was the case and it turns out that it's really not so as I said we'll talk about that a little bit more later we can see that there is a XLR TRS input on the back and then an RCA phono input then we have a power switch down here we've got auto standby on and off and then you've got a bank of different switches for high frequency and low frequency depending on boundary placement or if you want to just kind of tweak the settings to your own desire you can do that as well now flipping back around to the front as you can see this is a black speaker uh, overall black baffle black overall background and all of that stuff but it also comes in white the white is currently not available at least as of right now and I don't know that it really matters but I really do like the look of the speaker I do like the shape of the front baffle. I like how, you know, it's kind of sloped and maybe they did it to help with diffraction issues or maybe that's just an overall aesthetic they were going for and the diffraction uh, benefit was just a side benefit. I'm not sure, but I do like the look of the overall speaker. In terms of sound, there's a few things that I really do like about the speaker, but there's a few things that are kind of problematic. Starting out with the things I do like, let's see, uh, the bass. I really, really do enjoy the bass. I think the F3 on this speaker is at about, somewhere in the low 60s, something like that. We'll double check the data in a little bit, but it has enough to get you down into kick drum area. So the 50 to 60 Hertz region gives you enough to get that kick drum area. The bass isn't peaky like some ported speakers, especially ported powered monitor speakers in this price range for 340 bucks. You know, sometimes you're going to get some junk. I will say that directly comparing this to the JBL 305P MK2, which is a competitor of this speaker because they're practically exactly the same price or like maybe $10, $20 difference there. Um, I like this speaker more. And the reason I like this speaker more is because the JBL that I tested had a lot of baffle resonance and it drove me insane. So while the overall response of the JBL looked better, the resonances that I heard and that you could actually find in the data if you went digging were to the point where it was just annoying. And once you heard it, you couldn't get over it. I would not recommend that speaker. And if you're looking in this price range, I would recommend this speaker. Um, another thing that I do like about this speaker is that the high frequency is pretty good, uh, pretty well maintained. It's not perfect. And some of that is due to simply just having this bar on the front of the speaker or the tweeter. Uh, it creates a dip on axis. Again, we'll talk about that too. But the overall sound quality of the speaker, I do like. Let's go ahead and take a look at the data and talk about what we found in the data and then we'll come back and we'll wrap this up. Okay, we are at my website and this is at aaronsaudiocorner.com. I will provide a link in the description below. Front of the speaker. And if you want a better understanding of what this data means, I have provided a link to a set of videos here where I have talked about the data and what it means and giving you examples and all that stuff. And you can click this link or I'll drop a link up here in a card. You can follow that. and look at that in your own time. I'm going to hit the highlights for this for now and we've already seen all of this. This is the back of the speaker, talked about all this. The measurements that I provide are done based on the CEA or CTA 2034 specification using a very state-of-the-art device called the Clipple Near Field Scanner which is about $100,000 uh, USD retail for the scanner and the software that you need. It allows you to get anechoic data which is to mean that it's data about the speaker uh, without room interaction. So you're able to just look at how the raw speaker performs and then you can actually estimate how the speaker is gonna perform in your room and it works very, very well, the estimation does. So let's go ahead and look at this. It's the setup of the speaker on the scanner. I'm gonna keep going now. This is the first set of data 
And what we're looking at here is black on-axis response. And as I said earlier, the on-axis response is uh, it's not quite ideal. So you would look for a more flat frequency response. But what we're seeing here is a rise starting around the 500 hertz region or so, going up to about 1.2 kilohertz. And after doing some testing, which portion of that testing was where I stuffed the port and tested the speaker just to make sure the port wasn't resonating, turns out that these are actually just resonances from the speaker. And you got three distinct ones. The first one is around the 600 hertz region, and it's right in here. The second one is around the 800 hertz region, right in here. And then the third one is around the 1.2 to 1.5, somewhere in that region, uh, as we're seeing right here. And I believe those are all just due to standing waves from the internal enclosure itself, because if you do the math of the distance from side walls to side wall height, uh, width, and depth, then you get a frequency that corresponds with these three almost exactly. So that's what I'm thinking the issue is. Uh, and then if we go a little bit further in frequency, we can see there's a dip on axis around three to four kilohertz, which is, I believe, the crossover region on this speaker. So there's not quite a good matchup on the uh, tweeter to waveguide to mid-range, but it's actually not terrible. And the manufacturer actually even states to put the ear level or the reference level vertically uh, between the waveguide and the midwoofer. I tested that actually the first time following their recommendation. Turns out that they were wrong because then you wind up with even more of a dip. We'll see that in, the, in further data. Now we're gonna look at the early reflections directivity indices, which is this dash blue line down here. And what I'm looking at here is just a trend line. Where, how is the trend line behaving? Is there any deviation from the trend line? And the trend line actually looks pretty good until you get to about eight kilohertz or so, and then weird things happen. I believe some of that is made up of the, like probably due to the bar on the front of the tweeter, but there's no way for me to know that without doing you know, some crazy testing that I just don't have the time or ability to do at this very moment. It could be some form of diffraction, you know, maybe from the waveguide itself. I just, I just don't know. Uh, and it doesn't really matter what's causing it right now. What matters is that we're seeing it and it's evident in the data. And what you can expect then is if you were to listen to these speakers in the far field, then the sound reflection bouncing off the walls and coming out your ears is gonna be different from the direct sound that you're listening to when the speaker's facing directly at you, which means that you know you really probably shouldn't put these speakers too far away from you, but that's okay because they're near-field speakers. They're not designed to be placed that way. So in this case, I'm really just looking for trend lines. And again, if we're looking at the on-axis response, this 500 to one kilohertz region has just got some issues. And I would recommend making equalization changes based on this. You wind up with a pretty good speaker after that. And then we're gonna keep going down. We're gonna look at the trend of the SPL horizontal and we can see that you know it actually looks pretty decent. There's some bunching up of frequencies in this 1.2 kilohertz area. Again, I think that's a sign of resonance. Uh, we also see that here and then here again around the 800 hertz. Uh, both I believe are also signs of resonance. But if we go higher frequency, the waveguide seems to be doing a pretty good job even when you have this diffraction element going into the 12 kilohertz region, uh, the on-axis on and off-axis response all trend relatively the same, which gives the impression then that this speaker could be EQ to have a pretty good overall response on and off-axis uh, vertically. Now, this is the one thing that really is worth noting. Uh, as I said before, you know the manufacturer says to be between the tweeter or yeah, between the tweeter and the mid-range for vertical listening, but that's not the case. You wanna be at least at the tweeter level, but it actually looks like it could even be better if you go above the tweeter level by about 10 degrees, because if you follow this red solid line here, uh, it kind of fills in that gap in the three to four kilohertz area, but then it starts falling off, does some weird stuff at about eight, seven, eight kilohertz. So it's kind of a, a guessing game, maybe even five degrees above the tweeter axis might be ideal. I think most people probably aren't gonna be splitting hairs between uh, those axes, but it's worth noting that there is a difference and I would definitely not recommend listening below the tweeter line. The on-axis linearity is something I like to look at to get an idea of the roll-off rate on the low end as well as you know how linear is the response. Now we've already discussed this 500 to one kilohertz region. We know that's not linear. 
But let's go and look at the lower end. We can see an F3 of 61 hertz. So this speaker does pretty good at getting down low. Uh, it doesn't get down to 50, you know, but it's a five and a quarter inch woofer. I think this is pretty good and I was actually pretty happy with the sound that I got. Now we're gonna look at the globe plots. And the thing that I wanna point out here is, notice these red areas, okay? These red areas are right behind the speaker and normally that would indicate some kind of uh, a port resonance or something, but the fact that there's three distinct ones, I, I don't think to this date I've seen three distinct port resonances. And when I plugged the port, these didn't show up, um, at least not to the degree that we're seeing here. So what this makes me think is that again, you've got internal standing waves going on that are resonating the cabinet and it's leaking out the back. If you were to do a near field measurement of the port, you'd probably see some peaks there and you might make the wrong assumption that the port is turbulent and causing issues and that's not the case. It's actually the enclosure leaking the internal noise through the port. So uh, yeah, that's not great, but luckily those resonances aren't terribly audible, at least to my ears. Now the vertical radiation pattern, and look at this big hole right here in this, what is this, the two to three kilohertz ballpark? Yeah, there's a huge suck out if you go below the tweeter line. Do not go below the tweeter line. If anything, go above the tweeter line a little bit, but not too far. Uh, distortion, let's look at the distortion here. Distortion overall looks pretty good at 86 dB. Then if we go to 96 dB, uh, it still looks pretty decent, but there's limiting going on with the speaker. Let's talk about that. If I compare the output of 76 dB versus 86 dB, 96 dB, and 102 dB, what this graphic is telling me is that this speaker is providing limiting, so you basically can't blow it. And that's true, I actually cranked the speaker all the way up, never heard any mechanical noise whatsoever, which is a great thing, but that's also due to the fact that the internal DSP is limiting the output potential so you don't blow the speaker up. And that's fine, it's supposed to be a near field speaker. You're not expected to be using this for home theater. So that's kind of a duh thing, right? Long-term compression uh, looks really good at 86 dB, almost perfectly flat until you get down to 50 Hertz. You're not gonna get a lot of output on the low end with the speakers. You're, you're still gonna need a subwoofer uh, if you wanna get really low bass. But for most desktop situations, I think you'd probably be pretty happy with these. Uh, 96 dB, I've kind of expected to see this, and actually it's really not as bad as I thought it was going to be. Uh, there's hardly any compression. I mean, you're talking about a quarter of a dB for long-term listening. That's really not bad. And luckily, it's mostly throughout the entire speaker's range, so it's not like you have a few areas that are really bad and the rest of the response is okay, um, which means that, you know, overall you're losing SPL as a whole. You're not losing it just a key frequency or two. Now, when I stuff the ports, this is what I got. You can see that there's no difference really above the 500 hertz region, which is the area that I was really concerned with, which again indicates to me that it is enclosure resonance and not port resonance. And that's it. Let's jump back and wrap this thing up. So now that we've seen the data, hopefully you understand some of the concerns that I have, uh, not just in terms of objectivity, but actually subjectivity as well. The 500 hertz to one kilohertz region is problematic because it's got a few resonances in there, presumably due to standing waves, and that creates an overall bump by about two, maybe even three dB in response in that region compared to the overall mean of the response. The crossover region around three and a half kilohertz has a dip, even on axis with the tweeter, uh, and it works actually better, I think, if maybe you go up above the tweeter line by about 10 degrees. I wouldn't go too much further beyond that because when you do the high frequency above four kilohertz, starts to fall off a bit more rapidly. I think that the sweet spot is either dead on with the tweeter or just above the tweeter line. And the other thing here about the speaker is, if we're looking at the data, we think, discard the speaker, it's no good, it's not flat. Um, but keep in mind the target audience. The people who are gonna be using this kind of speaker are gonna be using these as computer mixing, monitoring type speakers and or DJ types who will have some kind of mixing console and they'll have equalization available, both groups of people will. Even me, with just using Apple Music on my computer, there's a little simple equalizer built in. It's probably one octave bands. I mean, it's not much. There's 500, one kilohertz, two kilohertz, and then maybe four or eight. I can't really remember now, but it's enough. Even with as minimal as it is, it's enough to allow me to bring that five to one kilohertz region down in level 
and then give the three kilohertz to four kilohertz region a little bit of a boost and make the speaker a lot more neutral than it is out of the box. But even out of the box, I do like the overall sound of the speaker. And I think a lot of that is due to the nice impact that the bass provides you. There's not a lot of muddiness in the two to 250 hertz region. And overall, I do like the way the speaker sounds. But if you're gonna be using this on a computer, throw you a few bands of EQ on it, use my data, help it to help you flatten out the response. And I promise you, you will have an even better speaker in the long run. And that's it for this review. I hope you guys appreciate it and I hope you learned something. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below and I will do my best to answer as soon as I can. Um, if you plan on buying the speaker, I will drop a B&H photo link in the description below. Now that is an affiliate link and that helps me earn a small commission at no additional cost to you. And that helps me to keep this channel going and you know fund the other things that I want to buy and the tools and stuff like that that I need. And with that said, I'm out. You guys take care. Talk to y'all later. Peace.